So the simple truth is, government are just in a complete failure and fallout and I think they've just completely given up on any idea at all of what they need to do and how they need to deal with it. You remember that time at school when we would all be in the playground and we'd be picking teams. They play football or rugby or netball or hockey or whatever it was and all the really popular kids would get picked first and then you'd be left with this kind of little sad huddle of utterly dejected, rejected, forlorn, kind of just dumped poor kids staring at their shoes that nobody else wanted. Well, guess who's now running the country? <laughs> well, we're actually here to talk about the plight of Britain's rivers. Yeah. And you have turned your hand to environmentalism. But can I just start by asking how? Um, well, I, I kind of, I still kind of find it really weird when people even use that term. Really? Yeah. Um, and it's becoming clearly quite frequent. The, the way I normally describe it, I've had this glorious, glorious life where for 40 years of my adult life, random people will walk up to me in the street and want to talk to me about music. Mm -hmm. And in a very excited, engaged, enjoyable way, records they bought and gigs they've been to and things they've heard and radio stations and John Peel and just glorious, glorious conversations. Over the last couple of years, that's gone from talking about music to talking about shite in rivers. <laughs> Does that make and you I, mad? I find myself questioning, Fergal, what have you done here, my friend? <laughs> and I'm quite keen to go back to talk about music again really? as quickly as we possibly can. Yeah, yeah, I get... I've had this huge passion and uh, fondness for fly fishing since I was 10, 11 years old. It's something I've never particularly tried to inflict on others, is why on earth would, would they be interested? Uh, it has involved clearly most of my life standing around in the middle of rivers waving bits of carbon fibre around my head in some futile act to beat some river into a foaming, steaming, galloping mess whilst I try and persuade some poor disobliging trout or salmon <laughs> to grab a hold uh, of the other end of the line and hang on for me. Mm -hmm. And it was through that passion um, that I ultimately became chairman of the oldest fly fishing club in the country, still fishing the same stretch of river by way of indication a couple of weeks back um, when I actually stood down as chairman, but I got to chair the 183rd annual general meeting of the Amwell Magna Fishery. Oh, wow. Now, when I was becoming chairman, we found ourselves in a bit of an interesting position uh, and having a conversation with the Environment Agency and Thames Water about lack of water in the river. And as it transpired, it was a conversation that had already been going on for the better part of 15 years. Gosh. Where the water was disappearing from the river. The Environment Agency pointed the finger at Thames Water. Thames Water pointed the finger at the Environment Agency. You then a whole bunch of people in these incredible bureaucracies going round and round in circles, having endless meetings and cups of tea, doing endless invertebrate surveys, hydrology surveys at one point developing a mathematical model of the aquifer, the groundwater underneath Hertfordshire, and hiring huge global consultancy companies to try and figure out what was going on. Now, in my life, coming from the music industry, I've no reference point how you can spend 15 years looking at any problem and not actually figuring out and fixing it. You know, the music industry, you've got a week. Mm -hmm. An old boss of mine used to ask me on a Monday morning, it's very simple, Fergal, how many records do we have in the top 40? There you go. So you've got a week. The pressure's on. To go and get your rack together, get something sorted, implement it, fix it, get it done and make sure it's a glorious success. Mm -hmm. So I'm still flummoxed all these years later. How on earth do you actually have a conversation about for 15 years about something and never fix it? So in my case, as you probably tell, I'm not very good at sitting in very long meetings and particularly meetings that don't actually ever achieve anything. So we worked with a remarkable, wonderful little charity called Fish Legal and they help fishing clubs take people like the Environment Agency to the High Court to judicial review. Mm -hmm. And we spent a year and a half working with them. Um, as I normally portray it, I was not only basically standing on the steps of the High Court I was banging furiously on the door, ringing the doorbell in a mad rage, demanding to be let in. 
Now, we got our thing resolved quite quickly, but it took that step to do it. Mm -hmm. And I can happily report there is more water going down the Amal Magna fishery than there has been for decades. The place is looking magnificent and the river's in fine fettle. But that made me really curious. Why 60 old men and women of a certain age who just want to go fishing had to take the Environment Agency to the steps of the High Court? What was going on? And if we had to do that, what else might be going on out there that nobody actually knew anything about? Mm -hmm. um, and as I now describe it, that curiosity gave me an itch and stupidly and foolishly and naively I scratched that itch and here I am five years later and we've now exposed the just depth and breadth of a collapse in my viewpoint of 30 years of political indifference to the environment, uh, 30 years of failure of regulation. There is no other explanation for it. Both regulators of the water industry have utterly failed to control the activities of that industry. And that created a massive vacuum which water companies have exploited to their benefit. Mm -hmm. uh, symptoms of that, as best I can figure out, water companies have made off with about £72 billion pounds worth of our money. Gosh. Those companies are currently carrying £60 billion pounds worth of debt every single river in the country is polluted and one of the biggest sources of that pollution is the water industry well that's not quite what therese coffee had to say in a select oh, committee just last week <laughs> <laughs> she said that 93 percent of our rivers were good they're not, not in the least and i'm very happy for people out there to google it uh the data is actually uh the environment agencies we measure rivers here on two categories one being chemical, and every single river fails the chemical test. There's not one passes it. The other test is the ecology test, and that looks at flora and fauna, bugs, insects, range and species of plants, flowers, weeds in the river, fish populations. And as we speak, and this is the Environment Agency data, and I insist that everybody goes out and looks it up, you'll find it. Mm. As we sit here, 86% of rivers fail the ecology test. And indeed, just before Christmas, DEFRA issued the latest update and the forecast according to DEFRA, unless there is a utterly significant intervention by 2027, the number of rivers failing to reach good ecological status will increase from 86% to 94. And that's DEFRA's numbers. And I challenge the Secretary of State to come back and tell me any of that data is wrong. Well, the farce of that is that those are her own figures. Correct. That's oh. DEFRA's figures. The EA under the Water Framework Directive were charged back in 2003. Oh, if you get bored with this bit, you, oh, you're, no. you're more than welcome to run away screaming. I love the river chat. Um, in 2003, there was a bit of pan-European legislation enacted in this country called the Water Framework Directive. The shortened version was that by 2027, at the very latest, so 25 years roughly after introduction, every single river, pond, lake, stream, groundwater in the United Kingdom would be in good ecological condition. And as we now know, as we sit here today, 86% of them are failing to meet that, and that's going to increase the 94% by the deadline 2027 and sitting alongside that every single river is polluted every single river fails the chemical test and indeed that fact was substantiated by one david attenborough on national television on monday night as part of the wild isles series so i suspect if the secretary of state's got anything kind of any questions over that she speaks to her own department speaks to the Environment Agency, and I have no doubt David Attenborough probably like to discuss it with her too. National treasure, David Attenborough. Absolutely, is the giant of a man. Mm -hmm. And what does that look like? So I know from, I used to swim often in a river in Hackney. Right. That started to make a lot of my friends the ill. Uh, yes, in the Lee. <laughs> you swam in the river Lee in Hackney? <laughs> oh my gosh, don't say that. Wow. I really, a lot of my friends were very unwell last summer. And, uh, 
I, I guess you're going to tell me why. Uh, we now know that over the last three years, uh, combined total, water companies have spent 7.4 million hours on over 1 million separate occasions dumping sewage into rivers throughout England. Mm -hmm. uh, it's my own personal interpretation. The River Lee in particular, and especially inside the M25, is pretty close to, if not the most polluted river in the country. Oh, good. Okay. I personally would not go anywhere near the River Lee, particularly around the east end of London. And I'm really sorry to break <laughs> the bad news. Yeah, I bet you regret shaking uh, my hand now earlier. Well, I carry a little thing of... Uh, Cleanser. Uh, listen, I can give you an example. Um, two weeks ago, uh, working with uh, Breakfast Television, Good Morning Britain, we went down into Kent and we did some E. coli sampling on the beach of Tankard and just outside Whitstable. Now, this was lunchtime on a Friday. That sample for E. coli in the sea came back as a level that I believe would be regarded, and I'm quoting, high risk potentially unsafe. That's on a beach that within the next few days, over the Easter holidays, hundreds if not thousands of people will be sitting on a beach and kids paddling and swimming and everything else. And the E. coli sample we took that day, two weeks ago, was telling me that that water was probably unsafe. Gosh. There's where we are. And what does it look like visually? So when you're standing in a river, I mean, is there a lot of the sort of like underbelly of sewage uh, in there? Yes, if you go anywhere near, there are somewhere in the region of about 15,000 sewage overflows in England. And if you go anywhere near them, you will unfortunately find on the vegetation, on the bank, and particularly trees where branches hang down into the river. And I'm afraid you will find the ugly underbelly of society. And I am talking about ladies' sanitary products uh, wet wipes, use condoms, and on and on and on. Well, that's the new ban that has been proposed, is that we ban wet wipes. Yeah. I mean, you agree with that? Uh, that's the third time in the last three years, government, or five years, government has suggested Yeah, I that. feel like I've seen it many times, actually, before. Yeah, but, but then I, my issue with that is I feel like the onus is going on personal responsibility rather than on, like, the conglomerates. Um, well, there's basically the thing, because it's the water companies are well spotted. Um, because it is simply a diversion a tactic. Right. Water companies have a legal obligation to build, operate and maintain sewage systems capable of, and I am quoting, effectively dealing with the content of those sewers. Now, as it transpires, the British government was taken to court in 2012 by the European Commission. Uh, were taken to the European Court of Justice. And the ECJ ruled that the UK government was acting illegally by allowing British water companies to dump sewage into the environment. And the court ruled that it should only ever, ever happen in exceptional situations. Now, that's not what the bloke down the pub might think. And the way the court thinks about this, and again, I'm encouraging people to go and Google it, look it up. The courts would define that as a set of circumstances so rare and so unique that no reasonable person could ever actually have foreseen that happening and be able to plan against it. Mm -hmm. So it's not a complete 100% ban, but it's 99.999% reoccurring. What's more obscene, year and a half ago, the regulator, when this Ferrari was beginning to develop in public, the regulator of what wrote to the water companies, telling them that in the regulator's opinion, we, the public, have provided all of the funding they needed for 30 years to meet all of their legal obligations to ensure that they did build and operate sewage systems that only dump sewage in exceptional situations. Clearly, they haven't done that. Clearly, the money's gone somewhere. I'm trying to ask two simple questions. What happened to our money? And can I have a refund, please? Well, then, I mean, the question should also be levied at the Tory ministers who are allowing this to happen. And actually, I was just reading about council in Warrington, yeah. a bunch of um, Tory councillors who decided that they wouldn't uh, call on the government to stop sewage being dumped into the rivers. Now, <laughs> why? That so seems so bizarre, doesn't it? Uh, listen, the whole thing is, and that's why government right now, and that this whole announcement this week, um, it's not a plan. It's... The third time in five years they're cl claiming they're going to ban wet wipes. And by the way, that follows the time in 2021 when they actually did a consultation 
and announced at the end of the consultation that they weren't actually going to implement any of it. They weren't going to ban wet wipes at all. Mm. It's also the third water plan they've produced in six months. Um, they announced a £1.6 billion investment in water on Tuesday. Well, does that override the £3.1 billion announcement you made just last August? And did that actually override the £2.7 billion plan you announced in 2021? And did that override the £12 billion plan that was announced in 2018? So is somebody in charge and can somebody please just make a decision? And now stood and watched yesterday the Secretary of State still talking about the £56 billion investment. I'm sorry, which one is it? And by the way, if I look at the £56 billion investment, that's spread over 28 years. There's nine sewage companies in England. That works out at about £200 million odd pound a year. Uh, let me remind everyone, just before Christmas, Thames Water announced they had made £493 million pound profit in just six months. That just puts that £200 million pound investment into context. And by the way, they're not investing in anything. That's our money. Mm -hmm. Money that, according to the regulator, we've already paid them. Right. So what happened to money? So the simple truth is, government are just in a complete failure and fallout. And I think they've just completely given up on any idea at all of what they need to do and how they need to deal with it. Somebody asked me the other day if there was any government minister was any good. And I suddenly thought, you remember that time at school when we would all be in the playground and we'd be picking teams to play football or rugby or netball or hockey or whatever it was. And all the really popular kids would get picked first. And then all the kids that were just really good at sports and things would get picked next. Mm -hmm. And then you'd be left with this kind of little sad huddle of utterly dejected, rejected, forlorn, kind of just dumped poor kids staring at their shoes that nobody else wanted. Well, guess who's now running the country? <laughs> well, they're laughing at us now because they've also got very fat back pockets. They certainly have. <laughs> oh, uh, when you sit looking at, I think there was one chief executive of a water company last year who got paid £3.9 million. Pounds. Nice. Total package, salary and bonuses. I, I, I'd do that job for two million. Yeah. You'd lose <laughs> it all. You'd be putting the money back into the rivers. Uh, I probably would. Yeah. <laughs> so what's the solution then? What, what, what would you like to see? I mean, um, fines, arrests? Oh, well, you see, this is, again, it's another thing where government's, again, just trying to throw this, and it's a tactic they've developed. And I think just to kind of cover up their own inadequacy. And it's right across a whole piece of other stuff. The call the other day for, oh, we're going to introduce unlimited fines. Okay. Before Christmas, you said it was going to be up to 250 million. Mm -hmm. In January, the new chair of the Environment Agency referred to that as crazy, as in the government's lost their minds in a kind of a way. In February, the Secretary of State actually said it was disproportionate. And here we are, four weeks later, everybody's now suddenly had this revelation on the road to the nearest sewage treatment plant yeah. and suddenly it's oh we're going to make it unlimited but let me remind everybody for 30 years of what has had the power to fine water companies up to 10 percent of their annual turnover mm. that's one big big incentive want to guess how many times they've fined a water company at all at that kind of level in the last 30 years even though they've got the power once so far as i can figure out so here's the thing, you could increase the fines, the unlimited, but what on earth is use as a power and a sanction if the regulator has neither the ambition, the desire, or the drive and ability to actually grow up here and go and do it and properly regulate this industry? Well, I don't want to ask a stupid question. Go ahead. But why? I mean, what would be their incentive to not do anything? Uh, oh, well, the regulator was clearly what's for me was sitting in the background of all of this was political decisions about the price of water. Right. And off what, for example, here in England we have these incredibly rare precious rivers called chalk streams. There are about 225 on the planet and 85% of those are here in southern England. They're part of a geological freak accident that happened about 80 million years ago. 
and there's a little cluster, um, predominantly in south and southwest England. And here's the odd thing. What was the question again? Why would the regulator oh. not want to act? Here's the thing. Those rivers are all clustered around London. I also southeast. want to hear about the chalk streams. No, that's the chalk streams are. <laughs> Here's the odd thing about chalk streams. They provide probably the highest quality river water on the planet. Right. And it's one of the things that makes them totally unique. It also makes them desperately attractive to water companies because you've now got this prime source of really high quality water that you don't have to treat very much. Right. Before you can shove it down a pipe and sell to your customers, and it happens to surround the biggest conurbation in the whole of the United Kingdom, the 25 million people that live in the south and the southeast. Now, water is big, heavy stuff to move around. So if you've got it right on your customer base, eureka. So as it turns out, off what actually had this internal policy for quite some time, if not decades, which they referred to as sell. Sustainable economic levels of leakage. The practicality of which was, so long as it was cheaper to over abstract and damage those chalk streams and to deprive them of the very thing that makes them so unique and so special, so long as that was the cheapest option, then fixing the leaky pipes, then they could carry on destroying the environment as much as they wanted. Wow. Now that only got changed about three or four years ago. Again, when it began to become unpicked, as in, sorry, you're actually authorizing water companies to destroy some of the rarest ecosystems on the planet because right. that's the cheapest option and therefore the one that's going to impact on consumers bills the least have you lost your mind turns out water companies leak about 20 percent of all the water they take out of the environment yeah through their own badly maintained badly disconnected leaky underinvested old network of pipes 20 percent wow gets wasted and again it's been driven and molded by well We'll keep on doing that because that's cheaper than putting up the bills. But here's now the consequence of that. A, every river in the country is now polluted. We're now getting E. coli samplings telling me that the sea off of Kent Beach is probably unsafe. Your friends go swimming in the Lee and Hackney and they get on well. Mm. And sitting alongside of that, because of the same lack of investment, it transpires London is now number nine on the list of global cities most likely to run out of drinking water. Really? We're now on a list along with the likes of Cape Town, Jakarta, San Paulo and Mexico City. What? Who the hell was in charge? The House of Lords Industry and Regulatory Committee published a report two weeks ago. Mm. That was the two issues they flogged up. Both things, all with the same answer, lack of investment in the sewage system and lack of investment in building the infrastructure that will secure London's water supply for the future. The EA now estimate we've got another 20 years before the demand in London and the South East outstrips the supply. Before catastrophe. So here's the thing, classic case, we're gonna keep the price down because that's a political decision, but it's now got to such a point, bills are now gonna have to be ramped up because you cannot allow 25 million people to run out of water. So in the end, it's actually going to end up costing us even more money. Because the goal things, you build something 20 years after you should have, guess what? It costs two, three times, four times as much. And all of that was about politics and cheap, short-sighted political decisions artificially depressing and suppressing the price of water. So we're kind of in a situation now, similar to 2010, when Nick Clegg and David Cameron were sitting around and they were saying, we don't produce energy. Yep. And we could run out if yes. we can't get it in yep. any other way. Yeah, yeah. But instead of building nuclear power stations, we're going to just continue buying it in. Correct. And then when catastrophe happens, everyone's bills go um, up. Well, it's, it, unfortunately, water, it's even worse than that because you can't run out of water. Let's mm. face it, we could all kind of live without the lights for a bit. Yeah. But you can't live without water. You've got, what, three days at best, four days, and then you will start to physically suffer from de dehydration. So water you cannot do without. According to the National Audit Office and the Secretary of State owned up to it on Tuesday, uh, we are going to need to increase the sources of water we've access to by another 30%, 4 billion litres of water a day by 2050 at the very latest. And here's the thing, anywhere near London right now, there is not 
that amount of water available. It simply doesn't exist. OK, there was one time in my flat when the water was turned off because there was yep. some construction going on and I found <laughs> it very stressful and this is just giving me flashbacks to that. <laughs> Are we going to be in a house? Oh, that's why water, you can't do anything about it. You have to have water. You cannot yeah. have London, a G7 member state, globally recognised, capital market-based economy. You cannot have London and 25 million people running out of water. But then you'd also say that you can't have this city running out of power or energy. Oh, listen, absolutely, but... <laughs> Power and energy, you can kind of live without. But we're getting close to what I'm you saying. Can't, you actually cannot exist yeah. without water. But the advice, so the advice from the Secretary of State, Therese Coffey, the other day was, yeah. well, her target that she wanted to achieve was getting household usage of water down. So yeah. she wanted to start advising households to stop showering <laughs> so much. Why would she tell people to stop showering as opposed to telling, say, Thames Water to fix the pipes? Well, you see, here's the thing. Not only will they not order Thames Water to fix the pipes, water companies have actually uh, had a statutory obligation for 30 years to educate their customers about demand and to work with and help their customers reduce daily demand for water. Now, how do you think that's been going after 30 years? Well, <laughs> I can imagine it like, because of the southeast and the water ban for many people's gardens, that didn't go down too well. Uh, the people in England and a very round number are amongst the highest consumers of water in Europe. Really? We, on average, consume about 143 litres of water per person per day. What are we using it on? That's a very good question. <laughs> now, I'm going to give you an example. When you look at some of the Baltic countries, uh, Estonia, Latvia, etc., you can think 80 and 86 litres of water a day. When you look at the Scandinavian countries, it'll increase slightly to kind of 1990-ish. Mm. So the simple truth of the matter is we use almost getting on for potentially double the amount of water that people in the Baltic countries use. And there's no excuse for it. You don't have to wash your car twice a week. You don't have to wash your clothes every other day. You don't have to put the dishwasher on simply because you put one cup and saucer in there. Mm. And you don't. Here's for me, it's the most incredible thing of all. We use world-class grade A drinking water to flush away human waste. There are people on this planet that have to get up in the morning and walk five miles with a bucket. They scrape up some muddy, kind of infected, mosquito-ridden water. They walk five miles back home again mm. just to begin family life. And yet we use world-class grade A drinking water to flush away waste. The simple truth is the Secretary of State could amend the building regulations tomorrow and mandate that we all start using grey water systems and rolling that out. We could start demanding, which he could, every single household in the UK has got to have a water meter fitted. There's no reason they can't introduce variable pricing, i.e. we think you should be able to live on 100 litres of water per person per day. So you can still have that for a fixed cost. Because right now you pay a fixed cost. Mm. And it doesn't matter whether you live in a flat in Hackney or in a multi-millionaire's house somewhere in the ages of the Green Belt of London. I pay a fixed cost and that allows me to refill my swimming pool as many times as I like for free. But the argument there would be the toilet water is yeah. ending up in the rivers, that sewage. Correct. So grey water has <laughs> yes, got but added if the, contamination. But if the water companies were actually complying with the law, and if the regulators were making water companies comply with the law, there's not a single drop of that would end up anywhere near a river except in exceptional situations. Quite. Another policy we were talking about just before we started this, we were talking about Brexit. Yeah. You still touring? Or? Oh, God, no, I've not done that in oh, 30 years. <laughs> no, no, that, that makes you hot and sweaty. But if you, <laughs> but if you were touring... How would you be tackling uh, these I these have uh, enormous, enormous respect and regard for the incredibly difficult situation the music industry and particularly young artists now find themselves in. Mm -hmm. uh, touring around Europe because of Brexit is fundamentally pretty much impossible now for British artists. Um, it accentuated because of the Americans in case of going to tour in North America have just massively increased the price of a work permit for North America to go there as a working touring musician. <coughs> so when it comes to Brexit, from the music industry's perspective, 
What is uh, in the industry referred to as the Anglo-American catalogue? That's the British music industry and the American industry. Mm -hmm. Combined, we had somewhere in the region of about 80% of all of the music listened to, consumed, bought, danced to on a Friday night across the rest of Europe was made by British and American artists. Wow. We utterly dominated it. So what do you want to do instead of sitting down and coming up with a plan to help the British industry become an even more dominant, increase the success, increase the money it's repatriating back to the UK? No, no, you make it impossible for British artists to go touring around the rest of Europe. Mm -hmm. um, the whole thing has been, and you know, it's an expression I've heard, it has become a complete clusterfuck for young musicians going, trying to go on tour in the rest of the year. It has become impossible. It's massively difficult. And there's an enormous cost element involved in the paperwork and the admin. And if you're going on tour in Belgium for the first time and getting paid a couple of hundred quid a night, well, the fact you're now having to pay some admin person and pay them half of the fee you're actually getting paid for turning up mm -hmm. simply to handle the customs paperwork and all the administration. Well, why on earth would you want to go on tour? Well, break that down for people who don't quite understand it. So it's, it's the equipment that you're bringing with you. What um, else is it? Every single thing that you take out of this country has to be listed on a piece of paper mm -hmm. called a carnet. And that includes, by the way, plectrums. So the theory is that if I take a thousand plectrums, those little plastic things that you pick on guitars with, if I take a thousand of those out of this country, I will be expected to produce every single 1,000 of them on the way back. Otherwise, I will find myself accused of having exported illegally plectrums or drumsticks or guitars or amplifiers or PA systems or lighting systems and all of it. So the simple truth is you run the risk and it has happened because clearly customs officials would not in any way be curious about whether that amplifier has actually got speakers in it or any amount of other stuff right. and it wouldn't be the first time that arctic lorries have been unloaded in dover and people made to account for the six guitar strings in a packet you took out a thousand packets i want to see all thousand packets and there better be six guitar strings beaten up used or broken in every packet that sounds insane it was because it's insane that wasn't on the uh, referendum vote I slip. I don't remember people talking about it, no. No. But it's also really sad because it means that touring will become a reserve <coughs> for the wealthy. What if you're a um, little band? That oh, listen, it, it, it already has in many ways. Really? And, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. If you're playing the O2 for 28 nights in a row, life's okay. Yeah, if your name's Ed Sheeran or Beyonce, it's fantastic. You're doing really well. Um, at the bottom end of it, when you're out there doing that classic slog and turning up in venues and there's three people in a room on a cold Tuesday evening in November, um, that's pretty much become impossible. But the irony is that for a, particularly for more performance-based bands rather than studio-based bands or artists, uh, for performance-based bands, that's where, to quote that old well-worn phrase, that's where you learned your chops. That's where you learned what you were doing. And I've given this bit of advice to any number of artists over the years. You will learn much, much more standing on a stage in front of six people rather than sitting in a rehearsal room for three weeks. Really? Because once you've got that audience in front of you, game on. You're now going to have to get them interested in what you're doing because they've no interest at all. And by the way, your mates don't count. And your girlfriend doesn't count or your boyfriend doesn't count and your mum and dad hanging by the bar at the back they don't count either they're six people that don't know you now you make them impressed sounds very intimidating oh no it's fantastic it is the most exciting thing you can ever do in the world um the music industry come on let's face it F for some people it all comes together all that talent all that ability all of that rehearsal all of that touring and if you're lucky, it all culminates where you get to stand on a stage and utter those immortal words, good night Wembley, exit stage left. There's no better feeling in the world, I can tell you. Do you miss it? Uh, not in the least. Oh. It makes you hot and sweaty. 